Hey YouTube, good morning. It's Chuck. Um, I'm back at you with another video I wanted to make today about something I do a lot of this time of year. It's making nuke boxes. Um, I sell kind of a lot of bees this time of year, a lot for a, a beekeeper with apiary my size. And I'm always needing uh, small nucleus boxes, um, either five or three frames. Um, you know, bees are kind of expensive these days and, I, and I've been trying to sell uh, nuke boxes that are a little bit smaller and I've established on a pattern I like, which is like this one I have here, it's all painted up. This is a three frame nucleus box. Um, and it, it works really, really well for, you know, getting small colonies going. It's definitely not as strong as a five frame nuke box, but if you have a good strong one and a half frames of brood and one frame of food in here, this will get going this time of year while there's a flow on very, very well. You know, if you're buying bees later in the year and you need a little bit more brood, uh, perhaps a five frame would be where you want to go. But in the springtime, a three framer is really, really good. And here in zone 9A in Jacksonville, I have successfully overwintered bees in these smaller nukes. Um, you put them close together so they can share warmth if you have multiples of them. Um, and it works pretty good. So I'm gonna show you how I make these. It's a little non-standard. I uh, try to reclaim wood from pallets. Um, just as an example, you know, I can, yeah, I love tearing pallets apart. Every pallet is not made the same, that is for sure. There's some uh, pretty good pallets and there's some pretty bad pallets, but breaking them apart and uh, reclaiming the wood and putting them in the, in the apiary is fun for me. Uh, but to get panels like this, um, you have to kind of take the pallet wood and glue them up. You need some sort of a pallet, you know, um, brackets like this. The, these are cheap Harvard Freight pipe clamps. They work really, really good. They're fairly inexpensive. Um, you can also get these type of panel clamps that are much better because they're a little bit more square. Uh, they're reasonable at Harbor Freight. The ones you get at the big box stores are a little bit more expensive. Uh, and this Bremen brand from Harbor Freight does a really good job for the price. If you catch them on sale, you uh, save even more. But you need to glue up these panels so you get this height. So you don't have to go to the lumber yard and buy a 1x12. 1x12s are kind of expensive. Um, and glued up panels from pallets, especially here in Florida, where the thickness of the wood being, you know, more than a three quarters of an inch doesn't really matter so much. So this is just an example of how I do this. Glue these up. Now, once you glue these up and you get the dimensions you want, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, you do need to take a trip through the planer and smooth them up. If you don't have a planer, you can do this. The wood will just be a little bit more rough and perhaps you, you can use a belt sander or a palm sander to smooth it up. But I love the fresh, clean look that you get after you plane it. Um, and it's a, a good project in the wood shop. Okay, so let me go ahead and get started. I'm gonna show you some dimensions. I'm gonna show you the process uh, and we'll hopefully make this a, a nice quick video for you. So one of the most important things to, to realize when you're making a nuke box is the dimensions are important. And they're important for the same reason the Langstroth hive has become so popular. It preserves and keeps the correct bee space so that bees don't build up too much burr comb and yet they have the same amount of bee space uh, through around the frame and the top of the hive so they can move around. And bee space is typically termed as about three eighths of an inch. You know, three eighths of an inch is about the, the, the room a bee needs to go on top of a frame or around the edge of a frame. So if you have a frame, you know, this, the bees need to crawl back and forth here. They need to crawl back and forth here and on top. So when you put a frame inside of a nuke, this space above the frame and at the ends, so the, 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 between the walls is the important bee space that matters. Now, when you're using non-dimensional lumber, meaning like lumber that you're reclaiming from a pallet or you're planing down to, to various dimensions, the formulas of building a nuke get a little bit more complex because you can't have a standard number that works all of the time. But as you can see from putting a frame inside the box, the most important thing to do when you use your math is the interior dimensions have to be preserved. Now, the interior dimensions I use, and I, and I have a little printout here that I printed out and laminated and I've got all of my notes on. The interior dimensions of the inside wall, for me, are about 18 and 3 8. So that means when you put a standard frame in there with a frame rest, the inside walls, not the frame rest walls, the inside walls is 18 and 3 eighths. 
And for a nuke box, the height of the wall is about 10 and an eighth, or 10 and a quarter. That's a little bit more than a standard uh, super or a standard deep hive body would put on because those bodies go on, side, on top of a bottom board that has a little bit of space. A nuke box just has a, a board on the bottom of it. So you gotta give a little bit more room underneath the frame so that the bees can walk out because effectively a nuke box has a bottom on it and that bottom needs to have the same space that a bottom board would have on your regular Langstroth hive. So whenever I get my non-dimensional lumber from the pallets or whatever I'm using and I plane it down or run it through the bandsaw, uh, to achieve 18 and 3 eighths on the inside is the objective. Now if I'm making a three frame nuke, I use a width of four and a half inches and you might be able to see that there but four and a half inches is this width right here on the interior diameter that gives me a little bit of extra room it's not really really tight and it's not too loose uh, to put three frames in here if I wanted to make this five frames wide the dimension would be seven and a half inches um, for you know a good uh, a five frame nuke um, with a little bit of space so Four and a half inches for a three framer, which is what I'm doing here. Seven and a half inches for a five framer. I use 10 and a quarter on the sides. And remember the interior B space is 18 and three eighths. I'll put those uh, uh, dimensions up here on the screen uh, if you want to write those down. And remember the interior dimensions are what matter. And it's because the thickness of the wood goes together in different ways. Now, there is some complexity I need to kind of describe to you here on creating this shelf based on the thickness of the wood. Uh, and I'll go through that with you in a few minutes. So one dimension that is the most complicated one to figure out is the length of the, of the panel that you need. Now, the reason this isn't straightforward with non-dimensional lumber, and I'm, I'm gonna continue to say non-dimensional lumber because I'm using non-standard stock here, is that in order to achieve the interior diameter, uh, interior length of 18 and 3 eighths, the length of the board here is dependent on the thickness of your end plates. And hopefully that makes sense. The, you know, the interior dimension is what you have to achieve. So if you're gonna put a board on the outside, um, then the, these uh, pieces on the inside will be a little bit shorter. If you're gonna put a board in the middle because it's a little bit thinner, and you're gonna use it as a shelf in a decoats method, and I'll describe that a little bit later, it's gonna be a little bit longer. So when I am taking my pallet wood, Generally, I know I need something over 20 inches uh, and I'm gonna have a little bit of stock on the end. So 20, 21, something like that. So when I take my raw pallet wood, something similar to this, I try to find a section of this wood that has got the least nail holes and I try to find a 20 inch dimension and I go to the miter saw and I cut out, you know, a piece. And you can see this one I've got is already 20.5 inches. Get a couple of those that you're gonna glue up together. And when you glue up two of these kind of standard pallet boards, and I'll show you how I do that in a minute, you're gonna get the height you need for your sides. And this, these two together is about 11 and a quarter inches. Remember I said I only need about 10 and an eighth high. So this panel will be just right for the sides. So using like these, these uh, panel clamps, basically you need to have a nice jointed or nice uh, sawed edge here so that it's nice and smooth. And I already did that on the table saw. And this is just gluing up a panel and this is basic carpentry. But the important point is, is this edge has to be smooth. Now, jointed is the right word, but without a jointer, you can um, do it on a table saw and just make sure you got a nice, clean, smooth saw and edge. You put the glue on there, you smear it around so it's nice and even, and then you let your clamps do the rest of the work here. Now with non-dimensional lumber, these might not be exactly straight, so get that seam as smooth as you can on both sides. Clamp this uh, down nice and tight to where that glue starts to ooze out. I like to smear it just a little bit. You can see some ooze out here on this other side. And this panel will dry up nice just like the ones I just demonstrated here. So that is how I do glue ups. And this is a nice piece that we can run through the planer, will be the dimensions we need for the sides of our box no matter what we end up doing with our dimensions because it's a little bit bigger on height and length. So we have a little bit of spare wood to work with here. So that's how I glue up my panels. So after a glue up is done, like I just showed you, you get a panel like this that has got a lot of rough edges. The seams might not be just right. You got some other um, you know, inconsistencies from when the nails popped out. 
Now one morning, if you've got pallet wood and you pull the nails out, there's a chance there's still metal in here. Uh, this is a tiny handheld metal detector that's kind of uh, good to use. And you can see if you go near metal of any type, I like to run this over a panel so that I'm sure there is no metal in here. This has probably saved my planer blades, my bandsaw blades and everything just a little bit because um, it makes it nice and smooth. Now this is thinner than three quarter inch. Uh, when I'm planing wood, I try to not go smaller than a half an inch, but that's just, you can go smaller than a half an inch, but that's typically what I do. And on this planer, I've got a nice edge here. Now granted, this is gonna be a little loud, but I'm gonna show you just kind of the motions of how I do this with a planer. Okay, hopefully I was able to take the volume down enough for you. So that, that went down to a half an inch, and I've got a nice plank here with some nice patina. Uh, little rough spots like this go on the inside of the hive if you don't want to paint that. The bees love building propolis up on these little rough spots. It's a little more like a tree. So, you know, obviously we've got some nail holes here. If I'm concerned about those and, and something as big as that, I will probably fill that with caulk. Uh, and a little bit of uh, maybe even wood glue and sawdust for some of the big ones. The smaller ones like this just don't matter. Really big ones where you can see daylight through that would let water through. We'll, we'll do that uh, at, our, at our construction phase. But that's how I, I, I'm playing up these panels so they're nice and smooth. If you don't have a planer, honestly, this may be a little bit tricky. Um, so my, maybe buying dimensional lumber would be the easiest, but boy, uh, reclaiming pallet wood with a planer is a, is a whole lot of fun as a beekeeper because there's so much you can do uh, with this type of wood and the bees just don't care. Okay, let me show you the next step. Now, one thing I love about planers and using them in the bee shop is after your, um, your buckets are full, uh, you know, you collect all these shavings and it makes a lot of wood shavings. And I'm just taking the lid off of this on film to show you here. Um, this is the best smoker fuel you can imagine. Um, so I take these shavings straight out into the bee yard, put them in another bucket that keeps them nice and dry. And it's better than pine needles in many, because they, 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 they smoke and they smoke and they smoke, especially if you get them going good at the beginning and you pack them down, this will create a nice uh, smoker fuel all day long. Just a benefit of using a planer in the bee wood shop. All right, so if you remember, after we glue up these panels, they can be of all different dimensions, right? So this is a nice glued up panel that has not been planed yet. It's just a bunch of panels. I got some glue and residue on here and it's bigger than I needed it. But if you remember, I need it to be about 20 and a half inches long so I can trim it down to the right size to get my 18 and 3 8 internal diameter. So I'm right now I'm just rough sawing wood to make sure it's a little bit bigger than I need and a little, a little bit longer, a little bit taller than I need. And remember I need 10 and an eighth high and this panel is 13 and a half when I make it together. So this is plenty high. I just need to make sure it's long enough. So this is gonna be the long end and I got a mark there for 20 and a half inches. That's plenty long. And I'm just gonna do a, a, a cut here. This is gonna be a rough. I use the micro jig system here, a bunch of different ways. You could do this on a miter saw. You could do this with a skill saw. This is a rough cut. This does not need to be perfectly square even. Um, so let me just show you how I do this. So now this is, so now this is an oversized dimension board that I can just run through the planer to smooth up like the other ones I just showed you how I do. Okay, now is how I'm gonna try to explain the most complicated part of this. Now this is not intended to be a, uh, a recipe. This is a technique and, and, and the, the math that you do here will, will matter. So you gotta think about this carefully, but I'm gonna just try to show you this one trick. So. I've cut my panels to 10 and an eighth high. And if you see this one, I've already got assembled. It, it kind of, it, it's 10 and an eighth high, right? So I've got, this is a, an example I'm gonna show you here. Now, I assemble these thinner woods uh, boxes with what's called a decoats method. The decoats method, it, and this is a guy on the internet that posted a, a technique years ago, and we've all kind of copied how, it, how he does it, because it 
pre prevents the need of using a rabbit or a router edge for your shelf. This shelf is created by this front plate. The back of the shelf is created by the handle that you, you uh, tack on there. So the decoats method uses a end piece that is between the long pieces and the thickness of it is thin enough to be the shelf. You can't have a three quarter inch shelf. That's the problem with using three quarter inch lumber is you've got to create a rabbit bit because this shelf needs to be about three eighths to a half an inch long. So the way you know the length of your panels when you use the decoats method is you have to take the thickness of your end panels whatever you dimension them to. So here are my end panels, for example, I've cut, you can kind of see how that end panel, and you've got to measure two of them together. And if I measure two of these together, I get one inch, because I use the planer to take these down to a half an inch. But if you did a little bit bigger, uh, you need to know that. If you did a little bit smaller, you need to know that. So I've got to add one inch to the length of these end pieces in order to get the 18 and 3 eighths in the middle. So if that makes sense, I need 19 and 3 8 length boards because I'm gonna use a half an inch here and I'm gonna use a half an inch here and you subtract that one inch off of 19 and 3 8 the internal dimensions are gonna be 18 and 3 8 That's the only trick that you really need to know here and a little bit about the decodes method to not use a router bit if you're using wood that is thin enough uh, to act as the shelf. Half inch wood, times two, one inch, 18 and 3 eighths is your inner dimension, so I need 19 and 3 eighths, so there's an extra half inch on either end of this board. So I've already cut this to 10 and an eighth high, and now I'm gonna go cut it to 19 and 3 eighths long. All right, we've got the hard part done now. I've got the dimensioned plank wood here from my lovely reclaimed pallets, which I'm really, every time I do this, I feel happy. Um, I've got my end pieces that are cut. Now this is four and a half inches. If you remember, four and a half inches is for the nuke. Let me get that dimension here. Four and a half there. This one's a little wider. I made this one wider. Um, don't want to confuse you. I made this one a little bit wider so I could put a, um, a, a feeder in here. This is four and a half. We'll hold three frames. Um, now, the glue up is just... I did cut, I did make one, one other uh, cut that I hadn't told you about yet. You remember I told you that in the decoats, your shelf is the end piece. So this is gonna go in the middle here. Now, what you may notice is my end pieces are shorter. That's because of the shelf. The end pieces need to be 5 8 shorter so that when a frame sits in here, you have B space on top. So this shelf end piece has to be 5 8 inch shorter than the end. So that's the last measurement I didn't tell you. Uh, read up on the internet for a decoats nuke. Just remember when you get dimensions on the internet, the dimension of the wood they're made out of makes all the difference. That's why you have to make inner dimensions uh, your calculation. I'm gonna go ahead and glue this up. I'm probably gonna put it on fast forward. Uh, I'll stop it if I've got anything to remind you of along the way. There is one more step before the glue up, and this is much easier if you do it before you glue it up. You can do it later, but it's a little harder. It's the entrance hole that you put on the end piece. I use a one and a quarter inch Forstner bit to just drill a, uh, a hole all the way through the center, um, but not a circular hole. I usually use about half, maybe a little bit more than half of the Forstner bit's diameter uh, on the drill press here to do this. So, simple as it can get. That's all I do for my entrance hole. It's easier to do before you put your sides on, otherwise you've got to get the whole box in here or a hole saw is uh, uh, sufficient, but sometimes the hole saws jump and the drill press is a little easier. That's how I do it. Okay, now that I've got my entrance hole drilled in here, pick the inside sides that you want. Remember I said that rough piece is gonna go on the inside and the paint's gonna go on the outside. So the rough is going on the inside and that is gonna be on the inside there. And then just glue it up to the bottom and leave the top open.
Okay, that may have been a little bit of comical if you actually watched that whole thing. Uh, you know, the first step on gluing up is always a little bit tricky. Obviously, you can use brackets and other different jigs to make this a little bit easier. It doesn't take me very long to kind of get that first tack in. Um, and I am just using um, Type Bond 3 wood glue and, um, and one and a quarter inch pins. I start with three and then I go back and add a little bit extra because the, uh, the structure here is in the glue and in the hardwood. Um, Okay, so there is the shape of our nuke. Uh, the, less, the rest is just window dressing. Uh, I'll show you as I go along. First of all, we need to do the end plates here. And I do these custom. So in other words, I come out here after I've stapled and then I mark them and then I cut them and, and put them on. I'll show you how that's done. Much of the scrap that was from these other pieces is what I use for these handles. I just set them up here, uh, get the width right, got the mark, and then I'm gonna cut this in half and it's gonna have two pieces. That's all there is to it. Bottom wood that's pressure treated, you can use that. You know, this is the part that's gonna be touching your stand or sitting on the ground or on your blocks, whatever you have. Uh, I like to do this custom fit just in case there was any wonkiness in your dimensions. Kind of get a squared edge on there, uh, feel it all the way around, and then just get a pencil and mark the insides like that. And then uh, take it to the saw and then cut those lines there. So that would be for the top. And here would be for the bottom. This is why I like to make my planks a little bit bigger. So I always just got a little bit of uh, fudge in case my custom fit lids and bottoms, you know, with this uh, non-dimensional lumber, things can go wonky just a little bit. So I'll cut these out and I'll show you what's next. Now, after you've got your lids cut, the last cut you really have to make is your feeder hole. Now, mason jar lids are not a standard size, and this was a hard lesson to learn, but you can solve this. 71 millimeters is the answer. It's actually a 2.8, but 71 millimeters. So go to Amazon and don't buy an inch dimension, buy a 71 millimeter hole saw, and that is the perfect dimension for a mason jar lid. I put it about one third in the center. That way I can have notes on one end and my sugar water is basically in an end. If I've got a, a blemish or something I wanna cut out, maybe I would put the hole over that. That would be the only other consideration. So I'll uh, do that real quick. I'll probably fast forward, but I'll show you how I do it. There is our mason jar. Uh, hole. I'll show you how well it fits in, the, in just a second. All right, last little bit of glue up here, and I told you I'd show you how it fits. The mason jar fits perfectly in a 71 millimeter hole. Where the hole goes doesn't really matter. I like to put it on the ends. That's just technique. Now, this last little piece is just the glue up, up the bottom board, which we custom fit, so it should fit just fine. Perfection does not matter for the bees. If you want to sand it, take all the edges off before you paint it. That's the time to do that. Um, the most important part here is the glue. Sometimes while I got that hole open, it's exposed grain there. I put a little bit of glue in there. All right, we are finished. We've got our nuke box with a feeder hole that is four and a half inches wide that holds three frames just right, and all we have left to do is paint this up um, to look just like one of these other ones. Now, I love to paint my boxes up with some colors in the B spectrum of light. They cannot see red. They can see pretty much blues, greens, yellows, oranges, browns, things like that. So I give them a unique color. That way, if I'm using them as queen mating nukes, they've got something unique to come back to if you have a lot of hives of, of the same size. But these three framers have been great for me. Using pallet wood to do them. You can make five framers out of the wood also. Um, but anyway, let, camera's getting a little hot out here. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I uh, appreciate you guys watching the channel, uh, trying to grow it a little bit more. Here's Chuck, Jacksonville, Florida, Zone 9A. Have a great day.